you mean when you, then I hand to you, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah that's okay. Okay, good morning. I think we're going to start because, you know, we're trickling in, we're chatting outside, it's going on. But we are going to begin um, morning if you are um, joining us online. Hello, welcome. In your pyjamas or not, maybe you're dressed. Um, it's Father's Day this morning, so we're going to have a chance to pray for fathers later. But first off, we're going to start with worship. So let's um, stand and I'll just pray for us as we begin. Father God, thank you for the privilege of gathering together in your name to come and to worship you, to praise you, to meet with you and be transformed by you. And we pray now, Holy Spirit, that you would come and fill us, fill our hearts and minds, that we would be led in the worship of you and the praise of you. Amen. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in all oh, his love for me. Yes, his love for me. Who oh, the sun sets free, always oh, free. I'm a child of God, yes I am. Free at last, He has ransomed me, His grace runs deep. For while I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, He died for me. The sun sets free, oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am.
their hope arise to the corner of the earth. Why you started by the power of your mighty love, you will make all things near. Jesus, you will make all things near. Jesus, you are reigning, you are right. why you've started by the power of your mighty love you will make all things new you will finish what you've started by the power of your mighty love you will make all things new just invite you to bring to mind something that you've been praying for something that you've been hoping for something that you've been believing for and it might be on the scale of faith uh, that you're not where you once were. But we do believe the Word of God says that what He has started, He will finish. We do believe that all things are complete in Jesus. And my prayer for us this morning is that as we uh, are in this time of worship, that He would bring those things to mind and He would birth a new sense of faith. You will finish what you've started by the power of your mighty. Love, you will make all things new. And you will finish what you've started by the power of your mighty love. You will make all things new. So sing, sing, the Lord is our deliverer. Sing, sing, the Lord is our deliverer. Our deliverer, His love will never fail. So sing, sing, the Lord is our deliverer. Sing, sing, the Lord is our deliverer. So sing, sing, the Lord is our deliverer. His love will never fail. Sing, sing. So sing, sing, the Lord is our deliverer. So sing, sing, the Lord is our deliverer. So sing, sing, the Lord is our deliverer. Hey, your hope rise up. So let hope arise. Oh. Uh-huh. 
Singing on 
says they who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. We wait on you, Lord. We are desperately in need of you. Would you come and fill us afresh? We open ourselves to you. Our job is to wait. Thank you, Jesus, that you do renew our strength. That it's not an if. When we wait on you, when we call on your name, you meet us. We are changed by, the, by every meeting we have with you, every time we draw near to you. We thank you, Lord, for all you are doing and all you will do. Amen. Thank you so much. Okay. It, um, first off, I think we're going to meet the... Ver- no, we're not. Are we going to meet... Are we going to meet the Coombses? Yes. We're going to meet the newest dad in the congregation, I think. Matthew Coombs. I mean, it's not really about Matt, is it? But, you know, this is a brief moment we're giving him as it's Father's Day. Um, so I'm just going to... It's really about Caleb and Pip and Matt and all three. Um, Right. Um, I think we can do a non-socially distanced chat. Can you come to me? Because otherwise we're not on the screen. 
See, see how, see how tech, tech savvy I am now, Matt, right? Um, so, who would you like to introduce to us today? Uh, this is Caleb Theo Coombs. There he is. And how many days has he been on this, in this earth outside? Uh, he's three weeks, one day. Three weeks, on a day! Hey, Caleb. Hi. Hi. It's nice to see you. You doing all right? This is church. This is your family. I know they're a bit strange, but they're very nice once you get to know them. That's really lovely. And how, how have the first three weeks in a day been going? Who would, you, who would like to answer that question? Um, I think on the whole we've enjoyed ourselves. It has been up and down each day, but I think we love him. He's wonderful. He's wonderful. We're just getting to know him and what he likes, what he doesn't like. What he likes, what he doesn't like. Yeah. We're just getting to know him. Yeah. He's very cute. Let's, let's, should we quickly pray for him? Is that all right? And you guys too, obviously. Jesus, we thank you and we give thanks for um, Caleb. We thank you for his safe delivery. We thank you that you have plans and dreams for him beyond our understanding already. And we thank you for his life and all that he will be. And I pray for Pip and I pray for Matt, and I pray for them as a family that you would just so fill that house and so fill those relationships with your presence that he would grow up um, knowing the goodness of the Lord. And I pray for rest, pray for complete healing and restoration and as much sleep as is conceivably possible. Amen. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So nice to meet you. And we are going to now pray for the dads in the congregation. So if you are um, a father, can you stand up? And if you, if, if you can see a father who doesn't have anyone standing around next to him, could you just snuffle over? Because we're going to pray. Okay, fantastic. So I'm just going to lead us in prayer. Father God, we thank you for all of these men in this, in this building and for all those watching online. We thank you for those who are fathers. And we just know that this year has kind of been above and beyond when it comes to being a father, being parenting. And we thank you for all that they have done, seen and unseen. for the moments of joy, for the moments of frustration, for where they have been phenomenal and for where they have also struggled and failed. And I just pray that you would fill each one of these people now, here and online, the fathers that we know that we can't be with today, that they would know your presence and your pleasure, that they would know your favor as they do this most important of jobs. And we pray for those of us who don't have um, a father who is present in our lives, for those of us who have lost our fathers, for those of us who maybe never even knew our fathers. And we know, Lord, whenever we have, when we think about dads and fathers, there is a pain that comes up. And there is a, lo a sense of loss that comes up. And I pray for all those people who are feeling that sense of loss now. And I thank you that you are the father to the fatherless. That you do not leave us as orphans. That you watch over us. You, our heavenly father, are perfect in a way that even the best human fathers cannot be. And that you step in. You draw close to us. You love us, you show us favor, and you so fill our lives. So we thank you that we worship you in spirit and in truth. And I pray for your blessing this day on our fathers and all of us, all of those people who also take a fatherly role in our lives, who watch over us, who root for us who comfort us. Amen. Thank you, guys. And there is chocolate later. We always have the discussion of can we give beer out, and we always decide that no, we cannot. 
so sorry about that. We, 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 you, you should know that we always have that little chat. Um, okay, it's time for the collection. The QR code is there, um, up on the screen behind me, I think. So if you would like to give to the work of the church, then you are more than welcome. You can just scan it, it takes you through to the giving thing. If you're online, you know what to do, right? Um, okay, so notices. We have a holiday club coming up soon. Yay! Um, because from Monday the 26th of July to Friday the 30th of July, and there are, all, as always, limited spaces. So if you do want your kids to come, um, then you really do need to book up pretty soon. So we do the, a normal mixture of sports activities in the morning and then craft and um, uh, fun packed, fun crafts, games and stories inspired by the Bible and much more. So you do not want your little darlings to, to miss out. I think that is primary school only. I think I'm right in that, anti Kirsty. So a, years one to six? Reception to year six. So your reception children can come too. So please do book into that. Um, otherwise you will be, be sad because they won't get in. Um, Please book your tickets. I know that it's not that fun to keep booking tickets, but it's, it, it basically it helps us speed of getting you into the building. It means Sally has to stand outside for less time. And in this British weather, we don't want to get Sally to get cold and wet, do we? So book your tickets, because then it's much faster to get you into the building. There you go. I did a little twist on that notice. That, wasn't, that bit wasn't actually in there. But, you know, I was trying to you know, engender something. Okay. Um, as you know, that we have boards up outside the church... Um, not last week, the week before. Well, then they stayed up. And it was like an opportunity that we, we had people in the building and we, had, we opened the doors and we were trying to engage with people as they looked at the boards and really began to, with the aim of focusing on, you know, that our whole idea of what we lost. And then there was a whole series of talks, blah, blah, blah. You know all of that. But anyway, some feedback, which is really exciting. Um, there it was a lady from the local estate agent just close by who came, he, she came around and looked at the boards. She then filmed John, as you can imagine, that was very exciting, um, explaining what the boards are about and then she put it up on her Facebook page. And we had someone else from the Swiss Embassy who came, saw the boards, chatted to people and sent an email around to everyone in the embassy because she said, we really need to be able to process what's gone on. And so she could see the sort of power of it. Um, we also had a lady who works at the eye hospital who'd been in the NHS and she'd been in a much more frontline medical position and was so exhausted really by the, the toll that the pandemic has taken on NHS staff that she's in a more admin position at the moment. So I think God, you know, was using these um, boards to really meet people where they were. And there was also a local mum who has heard our worship from her flat. But, you know, it's quite a thing to come into a building, isn't it? It's just quite a thing to come into a building that you don't know. You don't know what people are going to be like. You don't know what's going to happen. And so she came and um, looked at the boards. And it just meant that, you know, there's a lot more human contact. And actually, um, she, she popped along to church last Sunday as well. So I think that's just, it just shows that whenever we open the doors, there are stories to tell. And there are conversations that we have with people. Um, and so it was just to encourage you really we're looking um next notice sound and worship team this was going to be done by dave but he is sadly ill so i'm going to do a version of it so you have to actually someone has to sign up to prove my you know notice giving worth so we would absolutely love to hear from you if you could in any way think that you might be competent to do the sound you get full training don't you rich yes you get full who who wouldn't like to be a sound technician standing at the back you're looking quite cool right? So um, you get full training. If you would be in any way be interested in doing that, then we would love to hear from you. In terms of the band, you do have to have some general musical competency. So it's not like we can fully train you from nothing. As you know, we have hugely gifted and fantastic members of the band. Um, but we also, um, so we're looking to add to that so we don't tire them out and exhaust them. Um, so if you think, oh gosh, I, did, I do have grade eight piano, but you know, I've never really done it. Um, or, you know, I do love playing the whatever. Don't know what we need particularly. Um, then talk to Dave and someone has to. That's great. That's just one of you. I don't, I don't mind who, but just one of you. Um, and that is the notices. Fantastic, I know. I know it's your favorite. Um, Bola, can I invite you onto the stage? Bollett, you are so welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm just going to make sure. Bollett needs no introduction. She is our friend and a wonderful person. And I'm going to hand over to her. Are you okay there? Do you want me to move this? This is the sort of thing you get to do as a sound technician. See? It's quite cool. You, you, you can wear black t-shirts. You can do whatever you like.
Does that work? Excellent. Hello. Hi. Um, so hello to everyone here, everyone who's going to be watching in the evening, and everyone online. Um, I'm, my name is Bola, as Jenny mentioned. I've been a member of St. Mary's for many years now, and um, this morning I'm continuing a series which began with Kirstine and John, and, and the theme for today is People of the Spirit. Um, I'm sitting down um, because uh, last year I caught COVID um, in April, and unfortunately I, since then I've been living with long COVID, so I can't really stand for long periods of time without pain. But um, it's been, as these things are, it's been a journey um, with God and with him trying to explain to me that rest means rest and recovery is not going to be like that. Um, so I'm recovering. It's just a long journey. But hey, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here this morning. So it was um, Easter Sunday, 2002. Evening service. It's the first time I walked into St. Mary's. At that time, I was living in East London, and I was working with an Anglican church as a youth worker. And this was my second Anglican church since I began living in London. My first church was posh, affluent, um, Anglo-Catholic, which means lots of formal traditions, lots of robes, lots of incense, lots of drama. And, um, but they had this informal service in the evening, which is how I survived that experience. Um, but I have to say, I learned a lot about church traditions while I was there. I learned, for instance, that I love a high Easter mass. Just, it, I just love it. Unfortunately, that's, only, that's pretty much the only thing I love about high church. I think Advent is something people made up so people could feel miserable. I just, I, I don't get it. Um, I think if you live in, if you come from a country where sunlight is pretty much a mainstay, you don't get Advent. I think Advent only works when there's no sunlight. So that's my take on church tradition. Um, I also learned that small groups are important. I was reparented by my small group leaders, that first church I was in, and they are hugely important in my life. They, even though I haven't seen them in years, they, they will always be like my second set of parents. I learned that I love working with young people, and, and actually I left that church to become a youth worker. So the second church I joined was also an Anglican church, was not in any way at all posh, was very small, and what people would describe as low Anglican evangelical. Basically, I remember the vicar once saying to me, Bola, we don't have an altar, we have a table. And I remember thinking, what's the difference? You have something up front that we do communion from. That's all that matters. But yeah, I've, I've since learned the difference. Please don't panic. Um, <laughs> um, I learned in this place, because it was in East London, I learned the value of perseverance in hard places. I met young people who completely changed my life. I learned about the beauty and intentionality of being a multicultural church, which is different from being a multi-ethnic church. And this church, this vicar, who'd been there 40 years, was determined that his congregation will be open and welcome to everyone in East London. And that was the first time I had ever come across that in my life. I also learned that there are um, many invisible obstacles for white working class men coming to church. Obstacles which I still think are in place today, sadly. So, two completely very different churches. One very posh, one not posh at all, one very all, yay, robes and all, and one going, what's a robe? And, but they had this one thing in common. Their congregation could be split on the question of what does it look like to welcome the Holy Spirit? So in both churches, there was a small part of the congregation who wanted to see and experience the Holy Spirit. In both churches, this small part of the congregation every summer went to New Wine and Soul Survivor. And when I was in both churches, I went with them. 
I went to these conferences because I was hungry and I was thirsty and I was desperate for more of the Holy Spirit in my life. And I was this way because I had eventually figured out that where the Spirit is is where I wanted to be. Where the Spirit is is where I do want to be. And I learned this not because of being in these churches, though they help, but because of my own personal history. You see, the first time I became aware of the Holy Spirit, I was 11 years old. I was in boarding school. And I heard this group of girls singing. And it blew me away. They were singing worship songs that you've probably never heard because this is a long time ago. And um, my heart came alive and I didn't know what was happening. I was terrified. Like, I didn't even know I could have this feeling inside of me. So I walked away because I was thinking, well, that's odd. It's not normal. That's strange. And that was my first experience. Now, in Luke chapter 8, Jesus goes on a boat trip with his disciples. And as the reason, there's a reason I want to just focus very briefly on this, re, on this passage. is because when I first started thinking about this topic, when I started preparing, the word that came to me, the word that stuck with me was fear. And I was puzzled, and I have to say I was quite resistant. I'm like, Lord, why, would be this, why is this the word that comes to mind when talking about the Holy Spirit? And then he, you know, basically forced me to read Luke chapter 8, verses 26 to 38. And Jesus goes on this boat trip with his disciples, and they end up in a place that's not very Jewish at all. And we know this because halfway through the story Luke is telling, he points out that, a, that there is a large herd of pigs present. So we know we're not in a kosher neighborhood. And be, Jesus, you know, the religious laws basically not only forbade you from eating pork, but from having anything to do with pigs. So Jesus and his disciples are in a place that is out of bounds for Jewish people. And you could almost say that most Jewish people would think it was out of bounds for God. And there, they meet this man who is naked. He's living in a cemetery. And he's kind of violent and probably crazy. But he's also broken. He's afflicted. And he's oppressed. This man is a victim in more ways than can be mentioned. And his problems are a multitude. We don't know how this man got to be like this. What we do know is this. When he encounters Jesus, everything changes. Everything. This man who is imprisoned with both internal and external chains is set free, is healed, and is delivered. Everything changes. And at first, there's shock. Maybe, you know, amazement. And those first witnesses run back to the town and tell the people, oh my gosh, you won't believe what's just happened. And the townspeople rock up and they appear and they see this man and he's sane, he's as casual as you like, he's in his right mind and he's sitting at the feet of Jesus. Are they amazed? Are they jumping for joy? No, they're terrified. They're absolutely terrified. And they ask Jesus to leave. We don't want anything that can do that. We don't want any of that. They become afraid. And instead of welcoming the good news and the saving grace of the power of God through his Holy Spirit, they make a decision. They choose they want to be normal. They reject what it means for God to break through with his kingdom and choose to remain within the existing state of affairs. They want what is normal for them. They don't want anything like that. Reading this passage, it brought to mind a conversation I had with two church leaders also many years ago. And we were talking about, well, I was trying to get them to think about welcoming the Holy Spirit into their 
congregation, like having a service where we acknowledge who he is and we pray for people. And they, they were like, no, we don't want to do that. And I was like, why? And they were like, well, you know, when people do that, the services get out of control, things go all crazy. We, we don't want any of that. And I was, I was shocked, really. I was like, why wouldn't you want the Holy Spirit being a tangible presence in your service? And I, I mean, I knew these guys. I knew that they loved Jesus and everything, but it wasn't that they were trying to control the service. It was because they were afraid of not knowing what would happen next. Fear had become the key decision in them choosing to have a normal service. And a part of me gets this, because I, I do remember being terrified of the Holy Spirit. I was scared when I was 11 and I didn't understand what was going on. And then when I was 12, I, um, I watched possibly one of the worst Christian movies ever. I still think it is the worst Christian movie ever, but um, there you go. And after the movie, they had an altar call and I rocked up to the altar call because I was thinking, oh no, I don't want to get left behind. <laughs> you know, the sad thing is that it's not even the left behind of Tim LaHaye. It's, there's, a, there's a worse left behind movie if it's even possible. Um, and so I rocked up for all the wrong reasons. And these people, bless them, they didn't, I don't remember them warning us, but they laid hands on me. And I'm telling you, it was like the man's hand barely touched me and I just blew up in an explosion of tongues. Okay, I'm 12 and there's nobody else doing what I'm doing. And I'm thinking, this is not normal. So I bundled up the experience and I buried it because I wanted to be normal. But God had other plans. Then there was this girl, still at the same secondary school, who frankly, we all thought was crazy. She was, I think, so this has got to be year, year nine, so she was about 15. And she used to pray during the break time. I kid you not. The child used to walk up and down the corridor, praying in tongues loudly for everyone to see and hear. I'm sorry, but I remember thinking, this child is crazy. Like, what on earth are you doing? Don't you care? You will never be popular this way. Um, she did. She used to pray in tongues loudly during break. And then one day she called an, an, an assembly, <laughs> which is crazy. She called an assembly, and we all rocked up because, you know, it's school. Anything to do outside of classes is, you know. So we went, and this child stood on the stage this 15-year-old girl, and she preached. I have no idea what she preached. But what I remember is that the Holy Spirit fell on us like madness, like crazy. It was this feeling that I had. It was joy, and it was rich, and it was tangible, and it was heavy, and it was welcoming. It was this amazing, powerful, gentle, loving feeling, and I could almost touch it. I was shook terrified. What is this? How can this be real? How can this happen? And so I walked out before she was done. I walked away because, again, I was afraid. See, I was afraid that this joy that I felt, this amazing, indescribable feeling, could not be sustained. It can't be real. No one's ever told me this even exists. It can't be normal because why, why have I never heard of this before? And so at 15, I made a life decision based on fear. I decided that because this love that I was feeling, no one had ever told me about it. It couldn't be real. And I made a decision because I was afraid that this love that I was feeling, someone would come to me and tell me, Bola, you're not good enough for this. You're a mess, frankly, so we're going to take it from you. So I thought, best to walk away before someone even takes it from me. And anyway, it can't be real. So I chose to walk away before I was found wanting. And you know, it's one of the things that still frustrates me a lot about church and Christians, is that we don't say enough about God's grace and mercy. 
We don't say enough about how we can never be good enough. We don't say enough about how this is not what you're supposed to be striving for. We're not supposed to be striving to be good enough for God. That when God calls us in that broken and afflicted, messed up place that we're in, he doesn't leave. He stays right there with us in that broken, messed up, afflicted place. If you're in this horrible pit, God is going to climb in and he's going to sit there with you. He's not going to wait for you to go, right, I'm here now, so, you know, fix up. That's not who our God is. Our God is the one who sits with us in the mess. He does heal us and he does save us, but he never judges us and he's never waiting for us to be good enough. Because when he fell in love with us, as we were, that's who he loves. Your broken, messed up self. That's who he loves. He's not looking for a better version of you. There is not going to be Ebola 2.0 that is going to be better. There's just me. And there's me and who God gently and lovingly saves and heals and delivers. And I have no idea what that version of me is going to look like and I've stopped looking for it. It's taken me a long time but I've stopped looking for it. I'm just trying to accept that he loves me while I'm still messed up. Jeremiah 31 verse 3. God is speaking to the nation of Israel and I'm using the the message version. He says to them, I've never quit loving you. I never will. Expect love, love and more love. You know, and I wish someone had told me this when I was 15, because I was desperately looking for love and acceptance. Desperate. And by the time I was in my 20s, I was tired of looking. I was burnt out, and I was broken, and I was afflicted. And I was like, give me a place to lay down so I can die because this world sucks. But thankfully, God wasn't done with me. And so he shows up again, and he asked me to follow. And this time I said, yes, even though I had no idea what it would mean, even though I was still a little bit scared. But this time I was tired of waiting around to be better. So by the time I came to church, I knew that there was a place where you could encounter the Holy Spirit and it would be amazing. I have to say, I did not understand why I had to be in the countryside. I didn't understand why you had a camp to find it. And I just did not understand why people didn't seem to expect that God would be present by his Holy Spirit in the city. I mean, what is that about? So, back to Easter Sunday. Step into St. Mary's for the first time. So worship music hits me. John speaks, and then there's prayer ministry, and this amazing woman called Rose Shabaya prays for me. And I am blown away because I'm in London, I'm in the city, and it's in a building, and the Holy Spirit is present, and he's here. And I didn't have to go anywhere near a field in Somerset. I found a place where God's presence is real and tangible, and we were not just talking about it theoretically, we were experiencing it. And though it would take another, I think, two years before St. Mary's became my church, I still remember the relief of knowing that I didn't have to wait till the summer to be in a place where I could see and feel God move. Here in this church, the Holy Spirit is not a silent partner in the Trinity. Here, the Holy Spirit is welcome to make us people of the Spirit of God. Here, we don't just acknowledge his gifts. We're encouraged to practice them, whether it be speaking in tongues or words of knowledge or prophecy, whether it's healing or preaching or evangelizing, whether it's through worship, through prayer, in gathering together. We are encouraged to be a people where the Pentecost is not a historical event. It's real. It's here. It's today. In the second letter to Timothy, 
chapter 1, verses 6 to 7, and I'm using Tom Wright's translation from his book, Paul for Everyone. That is why I want to remind you that God gave you a gift when I laid my hands on you. And you must bring it back to a blazing fire. After all, the spirit given to us by God isn't a fearful spirit. It is a spirit of power, love, and prudence. When Paul is writing to Timothy, one of the things he's doing is encouraging Timothy to grow in his spirit and to not let himself be intimidated. He encourages Timothy in this letter to be aware of God's purpose and God's gifting and to be deliberate in the exercise of these gifts, to be deliberate in keeping the flame of the Holy Spirit, not just alive, but blazing, blazing, mighty, no tame not tame at all, not a cute, polite flame, but an intense, mighty flame. Now, what what does this look like? What would this look like for you, for me? You see, like Jesus, we are all called to participate in God's work in the power of the Holy Spirit. And this business of keeping the flame of the Spirit blazing in our lives will look different for each person. So for example, gathering together fills me up in a way nothing else does. But reading my Bible also builds me up in a way that nothing else does. And singing praise to God burns my heart up still like nothing else does. You see, I don't think the power is in the method. I think that intentionally seeking God is key. Choosing to keep the flame of the Holy Spirit blazing and alive in us is more important than how you do it. The key thing is to choose to do it and to keep choosing to do it. You see, there's a reciprocity in seeking God. Not in seeking an answer or seeking a solution to a question or a problem, but in seeking God. That when we draw near to him, he draws near to us. And I, I just, I find this hugely important for the church. Not just us here, but for all of the church. You see, there was a short period of my life where I worked for social services, and during that time, I witnessed a lot of multi-generational family breakdown. And I remember working with this social worker who had worked with the grandmother, the mother, and was now working with the daughter. And I remember at that time feeling desperate and asking God, Lord, who are we as church when this is taking place? Like, where, where are we? What are we doing? How are we in this world when this is taking place? See, the presence and the gifts of the Holy Spirit are for the church, but they're not supposed to be limited to church services. This is what I take from the earlier story from Luke 8. Yes, this is for the church, but it's not supposed to be something that we use to make ourselves feel all kind of loved up and holy just in the service. The Spirit of God is also about God's presence and power in broken, desolate places, in dry deserts, in deep valleys. It's about the power to save, to heal, and to deliver broken lives, ours and theirs. As a people of spirit like Timothy, like the disciples, we are invited to partner with God, just like Jesus did, in bringing God's kingdom into this earthly world. People of the Spirit are open and inviting to the Spirit of God to lead them whenever and wherever. They are like, here I am, Lord. Send me, use me, free me, heal me, save us. People of the Spirit are also thoughtful and careful and prudent and moderate where they need to be. And I think that it is heartbreaking when we run away from the person of God who is the comforter. What the Holy Spirit wants us to do is expect love, love, and more love. He also wants us to know joy, and he also wants us to see power at work. And he also wants us to be judicious about all these things. Being a person of the Spirit is knowing that God never quits loving you. 
And people of the Spirit remind each other to keep expecting love from God. Not condemnation, love. Not shame, love. Not fear. So people of the Spirit learn not to be afraid. And they fight to choose love over fear. And they keep fighting to choose love over fear. And they learn that although the Spirit of God is wild, the Spirit of God is gentle. And although the Spirit of God is unpredictable, the Spirit of God is healing. And although the Spirit is uncontained and immeasurably powerful, the Spirit of God sets us free. People of the Spirit learn that God isn't done yet. This morning and this evening, wherever you are, I'd like to invite you to reflect on where you are on this. Do you maybe need to renew a promise to God, to refresh, to recommit? Do you need to come alive in a blazing fire of the Spirit of God? What do you need to do? In Romans 8, Paul writes, all who are led by God's Spirit are God's children, daughters and sons. You didn't receive a spirit of slavery to lead you back into fear but you received a spirit that shows that you are adopted as children. With this spirit, we cry, Abba, Father. Um, yeah. I've, I've lived with lots of different things. I feel like the big thing for us this morning is about refreshing, renewal in some cases. I think for some people, there's the sharp edge of fear that needs to be blunted. So I think if these three things connect with you in any way, refreshing, which is just, it's almost like you need to hang yourself out again in front of God and let him shake you out and just blow into you. And renewal is, it's been a while. And maybe you feel a little bit stopped, stuck. And fear, the blunt edge of fear. And this doesn't have to be about fear, about the Holy Spirit. It can just be fear in general. Because like fear is like a spiritual enemy that you need to get rid of in your life. So if any of these three things connect with you, could you, was it stand up? Yeah, Why don't we all stand just to start with? And if, you're, if you want to respond to one of these things, what we do is we just invite people to put a hand in the air. So that, that means that we know that you're somebody that we want to pray for. And there are people who've been trained to pray. And um, so it's all very straightforward. It's, it's, again, it's also very relaxed. There's no problem in saying, well, actually, that's me. Nobody's going to actually talk to you about exactly what it is. They're just going to come near you and pray for you. Um, so... Would you like a moment to see whether God is speaking to you? That's the only reason we ever um, seek to respond to um, God's Spirit. If we think he's speaking to us, if we're in need of renewal, if we need to lose fear, if our church tradition perhaps doesn't really admit of these things, as Bala was explaining, maybe that's something to address. So just a couple of moments between you and God, and if you know that it would be good for you to receive prayer, you can just put a hand in the air, and then we will move around and pray for you. Okay, if you'd like to just put a hand in the air now, if you think God is speaking. Brilliant. And um, <clears throat> so we have a number of people who are, who are gifted to pray. And it would be great just to see these people with their hand up and go and pray for them. Um, uh,
He breathed life. He restored. Awaken my soul. I know that I've been made for more. You speak truth. You renew. When I'm in your presence, you show me your glory anew. Spirit, fall. Spirit, fall. Fall on us for we. Until you return, all creation cries out for you. There is freedom in your presence. Spirit fall. There is power in your presence. Hope and healing in your presence. There is freedom in your presence. Spirit fall. Come like. Come like the wind, come like the rain, God breathe your fire, fill us again, fill us again. May the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest on you and all you love this day and forevermore. Amen. Uh, now, if um, people still feel that God is touching them, you should do the wise thing and just stick around. People will pray for you. Otherwise, look forward to seeing you next week.
fill us again Give us your love More and more each day Fill us your spirit These things we pray I love, I love, I love, I love, I love your presence. I love, I love, I love you, Jesus. I love, I love, I love your presence. I love, I love, I love you, Jesus, I love, I love, I love your presence. Love is like a hurricane and I am a tree Bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy Cause he loves us Oh, how he loves us Oh, how he loves us Oh, how Yeah. 